It's amazing how one little change, one little shift to someone's character can completely change how other people view that person. So I just want to point out that this is the best thing that has ever been done with the Money in the Bank briefcase. And I know this is not the Money in the Bank briefcase. If you haven't seen Raw, I'll explain it in one second. But I tell you, when Brock Lesnar did this for around about 36 seconds on Raw, it was the best thing ever. What was he doing? My name's Simon Miller. Welcome to What Culture Wrestling. Let's up those downs for Raw. So yes, while long term, I don't think Brock Lesnar winning the Money in the Bank briefcase is what's best for business. Seeing him come out with a smile, I mean, he looked happier than a kid that had just been told they could have ice cream on a Thursday. He was also holding the Money in the Bank briefcase as if it was a boombox. There's already loads of gifts out there with people applying different music to it. My favourite so far is the Samoa Joe theme. And yeah, again, does it actually sort of help out WWE as we go down the line? No. Is it entertaining the hell out of me right here in May? Yes, it is. Lesnar's facial expressions are also great and there may be a way to save this if Brock is going to become a recurring character and actually turn up more often than he does it. We don't know, but like I say, I was smiling like a goof. He's, he's underrated sometimes. Not a massive fan of Beast in the Bank, which Paul Heyman said instantly, because it sounds like a toy that you would buy at Halloween. And then the pair started to address all the rumors. Did they beat up Sami Zayn? How did they get into the building at Money in the Bank? And why the hell were they in that match to begin with? I am going to say, I don't actually think any of that was explained. And if it was, it went right over my head. But hey. That's what WWE does. He is going to be hunting down both Seth Rollins and Kofi Kingston. And because he uttered a couple of other performers' names, they magically appeared. And yes, they came out separately. But they basically said the same thing. They want to beat Brock Lesnar because they don't like Brock Lesnar. They think Brock Lesnar is an asshole. And the whole time Brock Lesnar just did that laugh he does. He's kind of like a big chuckling lumberjack. He's like, <laughs> And yet somehow he's still intimidated. We did also get the best line of the night during this when Paul Heyman said to Seth Rollins, look, you're going to have to wait when it comes to the Money in the Bank briefcase. And really, you should be used to waiting because at WrestleMania 35, you waited seven hours for your girlfriend to main event WrestleMania. Ba boom pow! It kind of just ended there because Paul Heyman said he knew that Kofi and Seth had other plans for this evening. So that was that for Brock and his advocate. And they left. Now look, I'm going to say, again, just because some people don't listen, no, I don't think that Brock Lesnar should have won Money in the Bank. But for an opening segment of Raw to plant some seeds and get me a little bit interested, this was far better than a lot of the drivel we often see. And therefore, the finger of power, which is a thing now, people even tweet me it, finger of power is here, we hold it because it's just so damn powerful, it's getting it up. And a bunch of weird segments followed that. Mick Foley arrived with his secret title that he's going to announce later. For reasons I'll never understand, he was greeted by Kurt Hawkins, Zack Ryder, Dana Brooke, and some other fools were there. And Sami Zayn was begging Bobby Lashley to help him in his match against Braun Strowman later. Bobby just looked at him and went, no. Kingston Rollins then bumped into Triple H for no reason, who now is just in the Shane McMahon role. I mean, seven days Shane McMahon was doing this, but now the game is back on Raw, and I have absolutely no idea why. No one has even mentioned it. Just let the Money in the Bank pay-per-view, and now Trips is back, and we're just meant to accept it. And worse than that, he looked at both champions and said, Tonight, you're going to be facing Baron Corbin and Bobby Lashley. Are you kidding me, WWE? Look, my body has gone limp because I can't believe it. You keep telling me that you're going to change stuff, and you keep putting Bobby Lashley and Baron Corbin in a tag team. Arm is dead, but down. Braun Strowman then just absolutely destroyed Sami Zayn. They did go to the backstage area for a bit and Bobby Lashley was there and he just glared at Braun Strowman. Braun Strowman glared back because of course they're going to clash at Super Showdown or Stare Down or whatever the Saudi Arabia show is called. I actually don't know. It seems to change every week. It doesn't. That's just my brain. And then Braun Strowman took Sami back to the ring. Zayn did get a halluva kick out of nowhere and he thought he was going to get the pin, but of course he didn't. Braun hit the power slam. One, two, three. The actual match probably lasted about 20 seconds. So if you were a Sami Zayn fan and thought that maybe, especially given that Zayn's only been back around about, what, four, five, six weeks tops, if you thought he was actually going to get pushed more for you, he's still a glorified jobber, even though he did everything he was meant to, down. An in-ring promo with Lars Sullivan followed and he didn't say anything because the Lucha House Party came out instead 
to try and exact revenge from everything that happened on the pay-per-view. They did get a few licks in, but ultimately Lars beat the hoo-ha out of them. And as I said, on Money in the Bank's ups and downs, I just don't care. Down. And then I was hit by a wave of confusion, which often happens here on the show, because I was told it was Cesaro versus Ricochet, and that was quite exciting. I love Ricochet, and I love Cesaro, plus Cesaro's got new music, so I guess, you know, all the best of Seamus. I hope he's doing all right, but at least we're putting a spotlight on the man. But then he just beat Ricochet in a really short match. Now, the match itself was great, and some of the things that Ricochet did were incredible, but it left me feeling flat because Cesaro hasn't even been on the show recently. I mean, he pops up, but he never does anything of note. And deep down, it's that boy who cried wolf thing I talk about because WWE has teased me with the Swiss Superman so many times. Swiss Superman, there we go. I don't just, I don't trust this is going anywhere. And now I feel like we're just having Ricochet lose loads, even though at one point he wasn't losing at all. So again, love both of them. They smashed it here, but the result, I don't know, I'm kind of going against what I usually say because I like wins and losses, but I don't actually think this is going to benefit Cesaro. So this is what happened over the long term. I've lost my trust. And because I've lost my trust, I can't give it an up. If Cesaro becomes world champion in six months, I'll come back and get rid of it. But I don't believe it's going to happen. And therefore, you've seen it coming, is a down. Oh, by the way, and they had the fight to begin with because Cesaro had found Ricochet in the trainer's room and he was all like, <laughs> you're injured for money in the bank. And I was like, of course he is Cesaro. Did you see what he did? AJ Styles interview now, and he was upset because he lost to Seth Rollins and now realizes he has to go to the back of the line, but he's gonna climb back up and he knows when he gets another shot, he will win. That's not gonna be for a while though, because it seems like he's feuding with Baron Corbin. The suited man arrived to tell us that it was a travesty that Styles even got that title shot to begin with because Baron himself had pinned Seth Rollins in a tag team match a couple of weeks ago. You remember that one, it's when AJ hit Seth Rollins with the phenomenal forearm and Baron Corbin took advantage of it. So, you know, he is technically right. He even called it a slap in the face. And actually, I quite liked it. AJ Styles said, that's not a slap in the face. This is a slap in the face. And he slapped Baron Corbin right in the face. So I don't know how I feel about this program. Maybe AJ can get an amazing match out of Baron, but that thing made me laugh and therefore I'm gonna give it up. I'm not even gonna spend too much time on what happened next because I'm too mad. Basically, Roman Reigns is now officially feuding with Shane McMahon. They are gonna have a match at the Saudi Arabia pay-per-view in a couple of weeks, and just to make it even worse, McMahon has new hired help now, and it comes in the form of Drew McIntyre. So that's great, isn't it? Drew has gone from, oh, maybe he's gonna win Money in the Bank, to a bodyguard for a McMahon family member. Shane and Roman also just said that their respective feuds with The Miz and Elias are over, until we also found out that on SmackDown later on, it is going to be Roman versus Elias, and there's more stuff with The Miz and Shane McMahon on this very show. Great. Down. And case in point, The Miz then bumped into Shane McMahon and Drew backstage. He wanted to fight Shane. Shane said no, so Miz is going to take on Drew McIntyre later instead. However, then the revival did beat the Usos. So if you're all of a sudden thinking, wait, that doesn't make any sense, because I saw Jimmy and Jay beat the SmackDown Tag Team Champions, only 48 hours ago, you would be correct. But look, hopefully this means we're done with all that crass humor now and we're actually going to give Dash and Dawson a push. I will take it. They also did attack the Usos before the match and rolled up the tights to get the win. So it's not like this was clean. Give it an up. Wasn't 100% correct about the humor because straight after this, Dash and Dawson did spit and sweat all over Alexa Bliss who was talking to Nikki Cross. But that's better than shaving backs and that's better than having their penises set on fire. It was the Firefly Funhouse next, and honestly, I love these. This was a more kind of like shortened version where we just had a montage full of kids' faces that could really sad as creepy things happened with Bray Wyatt before he saw his new mask again. But they're just so good, they're so well done, and it keeps you very interested and very invested in whatever this character is gonna become. Uh, then, if you can believe it, we had a moment of Bliss segment that didn't suck. <laughs> what a day. Up. I mean, a big part of that is because of everything that happened afterwards, but still, it started off with Alexa and Nikki coming out, so they're best of friends, it seems, and there was a really good bit too, where a stagehand brought out two cups of coffee for them, but Alexa took them, poured one into the other, and then handed the empty mug to Nikki. I thought that was quite a nice little thing. The big guest was going to be Becky Lynch, but before she said anything, the Iconics interrupted, and look, Becky Lynch is really good at doing that stuff. The Iconics seem to get better every week. They're actually very entertaining, 
Hence why, like I say, it was good. They rightfully pointed out that Becky is no longer Becky two belts and she jumped Becky one belt. And Lynch then barked back by saying, you haven't even defended your titles since WrestleMania 35, which is also true. Lacey Evans came out and did her Lacey Evans thing. That wasn't very good, but hey, at least I tried. And before long, we had a six woman tag of, of course, Lacey Evans and the Iconics taken on Becky Lynch, Nikki Cross, who voluntarily said she'd get involved, and Alexa Bliss just got dragged into it. And when she did, she looked absolutely disgusted and then spent the entire time outside of the ring doing nothing. Lynch took care of business and won after a drop kick off the middle rope onto Peyton Royce, which I also like. It's fun to have decent finishes for matches, not just see the disarmor all the time. And then as soon as Alexa Bliss got into the squared circle to celebrate, Becky just walked off. All of this actually really rather decent, as is what happened next. And I know this is going to be controversial, and I admit sometimes I give something an up or a down, and afterwards, I kind of arm or are about it, going, oh, maybe I didn't get that one right. But this time, I mean it with every bone in my body. Mick Foley was here to announce a brand new title for WWE. And here's the long and the short of it. It is a 24-7 Falls Count Anywhere title. And yes, it does look like somebody's foot. But if you ignore the visual design, I actually think... All of this was great. It started there, right there, right then. Anybody could get involved and a bunch of superstars ran down to try and win a scramble. That was kind of odd. It was like the first person to grab it would win it. But I don't care. It was Titus O'Neil who got it at first and he celebrated like he'd won the lottery. He even dove into the fans. Straight away I thought to myself, oh, there it is. I'm being entertained. It didn't last long because then when he got to the top of the ramp, he was jumped by Robert Roode who rolled him up. So yes, that's two champs in around about 30 seconds. And if you're interested about the other guys that came down, I mean, there was the Good Brothers, there was EC3, there was No Ho Ways A, all the guys that you would expect. And I was also like, this is good. We're actually featuring on the show, which is far better than them vanishing. Drake Maverick was there as well. And I know some people think this was a poor start, but just try and move past that for now and remember how much we love the hardcore belt back in the Attitude Era, because that's all this is. They're just not using the word hardcore because that doesn't fit into a PG environment. Don't overthink it. It could massively be a benefit to WWE, especially if you start to tie in social media. Am I going to watch a video that WWE puts on their Twitter account if I know it sees this belt change hands? You're damn right I am. So yeah, maybe we do need to tighten the ship a little bit, but look, there were three segments here all featuring this belt. We had this one, we did have one with Baron Corbin and Bobby Lashley, which I didn't like because Robert Roode was running away. He bumped into them. He was like, oh no, don't tell them I've come this way. And Baron and Bobby couldn't have given two craps about this new belt. And we should stay away from that because everybody, just include people that are going to think it's important and ignore everybody else. But the third one, when R-Truth stole the thing, absolutely wonderful. He found Robert Roode. Rob was like, please help me, our truth So he put him in the trunk of his car. He then sent everybody in the other direction who was chasing Rude. And then when he got out, a referee appeared magically from the vehicle. He turned around into Truth and just booted him right in the stomach. He pinned him and he drove off as the new 24-7 title. And again, because it's our truth and he's really good at this stuff, I tell you, man, I was sat there on my couch and I was laughing my ass off. I can't even remember if I'm giving it up or down, but if you haven't figured it out, it gets an up. And at one point I thought maybe I'll give it a golden up, but then I thought, no, you've got to keep the sanctity of those in line. But honestly, this is some of the most fun I've had on Raw in ages. You can call me a fool, you can call me an idiot, you can call me a goofball, but I probably am all these things because this was goofball, idiot, stupid comedy. I'm all right with it, my friends. I'm going to walk over here. Don't know why, just am. Last side note, and I know I've gone on about it too long, but if you don't remember the hardcore title, just go and search on YouTube for when Molly Holly wins it. You do more like that, this going to work out just fine. There's also another thing I need to throw in there, but Mick Foley also insinuated that it will only be defended in the third hour of Raw, but that wasn't really made clear, and I imagine that will change because it is WWE, and everybody's allowed to go after it. So that's Raw, SmackDown, NXT UK, NXT, even some legends. And on top of that, and I'll calm down in one second, now the third hour of Raw is lit differently. It's all dark, and the Raw logo went black and white. Good, a visual change, and clearly you're testing the waters, just using it in the third hour of Raw, where the rating always does tank. Like I say, good WWE, you're trying some different things. 
I respect it. And it's a down for The Miz versus Drew McIntyre. Shane McMahon kept getting involved. Eventually, Drew hit the Claymore kick. He win. Then Roman Reigns came out to make the save. I mean, I've seen it a thousand times. You see why I liked the stupid 24-7 title? It makes stuff like this more bearable. We also had a joint Seth and Kofi promo, and there was a lot of grinding involved. And yes, you just saw me grind, so that's now going to be ingrained into your brain forever. And Samoa Joe cut a selfie interview and he was like, Rey Mysterio, I know you're an honorable man and you will give me back my US title given that my shoulder clearly wasn't on the mat. And pointed out he should make a good example for his son Dominic because if he doesn't, Samoa Joe will set an example all of his own. Samoa Joe is so good, he's like the Thanos of WWE. Give it an up. Main event was next and look, it was fine. I don't see how this could have kept anybody locked in to watch it because who wants to see Baron Corbin and a Bobby Lashley in a tag team anymore? I don't know, but it finished fine. It was a no DQ match from nowhere. That was never explained why that change was made, but eventually Kofi Kingston gave the trouble in paradise to Corbin. He got the one, two, three. At least our champions are looking strong. It can have enough. Lesnar came out afterwards and teased cashing in his money in the bank, but of course he didn't. But Heyman did say, like using that camera mic that picks things up, they will be on Raw next week to announce what their plans are. And if we do get back-to-back -back Brock appearances, again, it doesn't excuse him being the briefcase holder, but it certainly helps. Which brings us to the end of another episode of Raw. And it was a very, very strange one because some bits I thought were really entertaining and they did save the Brock thing a little bit. And I love the new title. I just do deal with it. I know it looks like somebody's asshole. Who cares? But then a lot of it was back to the old boring stuff like Baron Corbin and Bobby Lashley. But I was so entertained by the bits I really liked. The show itself is getting and up. And I think you know, this whole third hour changing the lighting and changing the look, maybe we're onto something. Please, for the love of everything, be onto something. I really would like a change. Now, don't forget to leave a comment below and let us know what you thought about last night's episode of Raw. Like, share, and subscribe. Head on over, I'm going to walk. Head on over to whatchulture.com and uh, what do you do? Oh, you read yourself some articles, then you go back, you go on Twitter, and you follow what culture at whatculturewwe. You take a nice sidestep and you watch more videos here on what culture wrestling. I have no idea what I'm doing. My name is Simon Miller. Thank you very much for watching this week's episode of Ups and Downs. Now go out there and have yourself a glorious little day. And remember, it's just wrestling. You don't need to get that upset about it.